There we are. You are online. And Great. So, uh, welcome everybody. A very warm welcome for me to this uh, second instance of this joint initiative open forum of today. Uh, my name is Andreas Klingler. I'm uh, the chair elect, the incoming chair of uh, the Joint Initiative Council for DICOM, which is uh, in the, uh, next in the row of taking the secretariat of the Joint Initiative Council. In my day job, however, I work for Siemens Health Engineers and I'm heading the Interoperability in uh, Competence Center there. Next slide. So about the Joint Initiative Council. It was established already 2007 as an initiative jointly by the, by the SDOs you see on the bottom of the screen, the standard development organizations. And uh, the aim is to really uh, to foster collaboration between the standards uh, and also between the standards uh, SDOs and also the clinical communities worldwide with the aim of uh, enabling the digital transformation and uh, based on information interoperability. And the major goal, of course, is then to, to support uh, high quality health services to individuals and to, to communities and populations with the aim of ensuring and improving the safety of, of uh, patients and treatments of patients. Next slide. So today in this uh, open forum, it's again about the International Patient Summary. You might remember we had already a session on uh, the International Patient Summary in the summer, where the focus was on immunization. Uh, but there have seen some, some progress in various areas also in the International Patient Summary. One notably is the recognizing of the International Patient Summary by the G7 states in, in, G, in the June meeting in, in Oxford in the United Kingdom. And um, additionally, the Global Digital Health Partnership uh, has uh, advanced um, their efforts to make the IPS in reality. And I'm very happy uh, that we have representatives of the Global Digital Health Partnership here in this call today, and which uh, also helped organizing uh, the other speakers which are coming from around the world. And additionally, the WHO not yet formally endorsed uh, the International Patient Summary, but uh, for example, um, the Digital Health and Innovation Team already took part in uh, IPS-related work, uh, such as the Fire Connectathon. Next slide. So the specific context of, of today is uh, to look at uh, some different aspects of the IPS, one uh, two very important aspects, and. Uh, First one is adoption, and the second one is implementation. For adoption, um, we are happy to have some speakers already today. Our speaker today, um, uh, this earlier session this uh, today, which was talking, uh, which was giving a view on how, how is New Zealand implementing uh, or adopting the IPS, and uh, in this session. Um, we will see how Argentina is uh, looking into adoption of the IPS. Um, on the implementation side, um, this morning uh, we had uh, the United Kingdom, a uh, very interesting uh, presentation, by the way, on, on, from the United Kingdom, how they are already making progress on getting in, uh, the IPS to the people. And in this session, we will get an interesting update from uh, Canada. What is the role of for the standard development organization experts regarding the, the, the GIC? So in, in this session today, first we have a, we'll have a panel discussion of SDO experts to share the experience in really making the IPS uh, specifications a reality. And uh, with this, they will differentiate between the standards creation, maintenance, and uh, uh, interact and interact with, with the implementers. And as you see on, on that picture here on the right side of, of the screen, there are many pieces which have to come together uh, to build that um, bridge. And I really like that and that bridge uh, for, the, for the international patient summary, which um, essentially is the aim of bridging care gaps and uh, helping uh, patients, but also caregivers uh, to come better uh, together and get a better understanding of the, the patient situation. 
but uh, it's not only about our one way communication today. We would like to also get your participation, the attendance participation of that call. And uh, for that, uh, there will be some uh, kind of moderated uh, menti um, breaks with interactive sessions using Mentimeter, uh, where you can uh, uh, answer a couple of questions which will be shown and to provide more insights on how you see the situation. Um, we will, of course, unfortunately not able to answer everything and maintain, uh, entertain every input directly in this call today. Um, but um, the goal is to collect all your, your input and uh, to digest this into a report, uh, which will be uh, uh, distributed later as a summary to this open forum. Some logistics. Uh, so please, everybody is on mute. I believe everybody is already on, on mute due to the logistics of, of, of the Zoom tooling. Um, but I'm very important for you, when you look below on your screen, you find a button for the Q&A uh, facility. There's some tool where you can enter questions. And uh, this will be seen uh, also by the moderation and by the, by the presenters. And you have also the possibility to, to upvote uh, certain questions which you found uh, especially relevant. And then you can take them up there and directly give them to the presenters. And um, obviously, we will not be able most likely to cover every question. But these questions will then, then taken up later and uh, then uh, um, answered also in, in that report. Additionally, uh, very important information, uh, these sessions are recorded. So this session is recorded and also the uh, earlier session today has been recorded and will be uh, made available shortly. And it's definitely worth also uh, having a look at the earlier sessions because uh, the, the agenda is essentially the same, but um, there are different speakers from different areas which uh, have different uh, opinions, of course. And it's well, uh, worthwhile to also uh, see what they said in this earlier session today. So for the agenda, we will first have uh, the SDO panel, where we'll shortly introduce uh, the speakers you already see on the screen. Um, then uh, the moderated breaks. Uh, the first one will already be after, after the panel, which will be then uh, moderated by Robert Zekwi. Um, we will have an adoption experience from Argentina. Very happy to have uh, Martin Marf Marfini for this uh, here in the call. And uh, then an implementer experience uh, from Canada, from the Canada Health Infoway, given by Attila Farkas. And uh, last but not least, uh, Steve Posnack will bring everything together. And uh, with, uh, we are sharing the experience, of course, also from the, from the ONC, from, um, from the GDHP, uh, but also with, uh, with the other presenters, especially on the adoption and uh, in, implementer side. And after that, we will close. Um, just uh, also follow us on, on uh, uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter, the Joint Initiative Council for any updates uh, you will also receive in the, in the future um, to get uh, the latest information, what is going on with the uh, IPS, of course, but also additional initiatives that the Joint Initiative Council is driving. So coming already to the to the panel and our first speaker will there be uh, um, Dr. Sylvia Thun, who is a director of the core unit uh, eHealth and interoperability at the Berlin Institute of Health. And she's also a professor of digital medicine and interoperability at the well-known charity uh, in, in Berlin. And what is not on the slide, actually, she is also on the board of HL7 Germany and uh, in this, um, position she also will then represent in the, in the panel. Additionally, we have Susie Roy from Snowmed International. She is their customer relationship manager for the Americas, a collaboration specialist and a research and uh, engagement uh, lead. And uh, prior to working at Snowmed, uh, Susie actually spent several years uh, from the other side, so, so, so to speak, at the co um, SNOMED coordinator at the United States National Release Center for, for SNOMED at the National Libraries of Medicine. So happy to have you, uh, Susie. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, Derek Ritz, who is a principal consultant uh, for a consulting firm, uh, EC Group. And he is in, actually advising national scale digital health infrastructure projects 
actually all over the world. And uh, he's also a liaison of IHE International, uh, uh, Canada's liaison of IHE Inter to IHE International, and uh, a delegate uh, of Canada to ISO TC 215. And he is a FIRE Foundation member, and he also he presents mostly uh, IHE uh, today in the, in the panel. With that, uh, I hand over to, to the panelists and uh, wish you a successful and interesting discussion. Thank you, Andreas. So it all started in 2007, where a project in Europe called um, Smart Open Service for European Patient addressed the challenge to create a patient record and e-prescription services for cross-border care. EPSOS <clears throat> was the main European e-health interoperability pilot project co-funded by the European Commission. Anna Estrelrich from IHE France and me from HF7 Germany had the lead of the working group for semantics. And the project, which later worked together with industry, HL7 IHE quickly came to the decision to create and implement the specification based on international standards. We created a CDA specification and a master value set catalog which is now part of the SNOMED IPS ontology. Many projects with HL7 engagement followed, such as E-Standards, Trillium 2, and on this basis, the European Commission asked the European Committee for Standardization, SEN, to create the European Standard 17269, titled the Patient Summary for Unplanned Cross-Border Care. And the standard, has been develop, developed in partnership with HL7 and IHE, using as a starting point uh, the European guidelines on cross-border care, the EHN EUPS guidelines that emerged from the EPSOS large-scale project. And European implementation guidance, the technical specification 17288, Specify, specifies how the standard can be deployed and tested with the help of IHE. So the decision was then easy to lift up the standard to ISO level. And the, the adoption of the framework is an ongoing activity right now. Some uh, countries already adopted it, like um, Austria and other countries uh, that we will listen to later. And um, most states are planning the implementation soon as Germany, for instance. And you can see here that collaboration of STOs and their experts make digital medicine much better and effective with the IPS as a starting point. I'd like to hand over to Susie. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Susie Roy from SNOMED International. Uh, we maintain and produce NOMAD CT. And um, with regards to the IPS, um, as you have heard and will hear from my fellow panel colleagues, as well as from the um, adoption and implementation stories today, SNOMED CT, which is uh, shown at the center of this graphic, is just one of the components of IPS. Um, I really like to think of it as an ecosystem of artifacts. Um, with many components that allow for the advancement of interoperability for health data. Um, and so thus it's really imperative that all of the SDOs as well as all of the components that are maintained and produced by the SDOs collaborate uh, and harmonize or align at some level to ensure the implementability of IPS. And again, as Sylvia mentioned, this graphic really shows that entire ecosystem and how it's also a feedback system that allows for uh, continued alignment and update between all of the moving parts. Uh, Christian, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so SNOMED International, we deliver a number of resources that can be used for, SNO, uh, for IPS implementation. Um, of course, SNOMED members and those with a SNOMED CT license can utilize SNOMED CT freely, but for those who are not in member ter territories, we make a number of uh, solutions freely available as well. In collaboration with HL7 International and with SEN, we produce the SNOMED CT IPS reference set. Um, a reference set is akin to a subset in SNOMED CT technical specification. And that supports all of the clinical terminology needs for the IPS. So that includes the uh, fire resources, the uh, value sets, clinical profiles, IGs, and such. 
Uh, this reference set is freely available. Um, and again, it's in collaboration to ensure alignment um, on that continued maintenance for the current needs of the HL7 and the SEND specifications. And that particular reference set is updated and produced annually. Also very exciting, we just announced that we will be producing a SNOMED IPS sub-ontology. And this will really further, to, uh, further the ability to use the data. So not only in the capture and exchange of IPS data, but also allows for limited data analytics. Um, and this is really due to the power of the SNOMED CT ECL query language and the SNOMED hierarchies. And again, this sets up those who implement IPS now for later expansion into more data standardization with the ability to do full data analytics and decision support with not just SNOMED, but other standards as well. And so we're developing it with this idea that the IPS is really the starting point and um, where we want to go um, to further really healthcare data. And so the, uh, the SNOMED IPS sub-ontology will be developed and released in the first half of next year, so 2022. And uh, that will also be made freely available via Creative Commons International Public License. So very exciting times, um, and we're very pleased to continue to support the needs of not only, of course, the SNOMED members, but also our fellow SD, SDO partners, and really anyone with the drive to adopt and implement IPS. Um, it's the power of collaboration, definitely, and JIC helps to facilitate a lot of that. So with that, I will hand it over to Derek. Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you for moving to the next slide. I'm going to look at two um, relatively simple diagrams, one that shows how the various SDOs and their IPS standards relate to each other. It's the one we've been looking at. And then uh, one that looks at the life cycle of uh, digital health standards. So next slide, please. And the next one after that, thank you. Uh, so in the pantheon of SDOs, IHE is actually the one that does not develop standards, rather uh, the IHE specifications describe how existing standards are implemented and how they may be conformance tested. So IHE's role is to bring the standards into the care delivery networks where they can add value and improve health outcomes. I wanna mention that the conformance testing role that IHE plays is especially important in the IPS work where there are important patient safety and quality of care aspects. Uh, next slide, please. And after that, And one more. Thank you very much. Uh, superimposing the uh, various SDOs onto this graphic, the one that uh, that shows what is the life cycle for uh, any particular standard specification, we see where IHE makes its contribution. So IHE's role and the role of its testing services organization, IHE Catalyst, is to develop, ballot, and publish implementable, conformance testable specifications and then to leverage its decades of expertise in its modern tooling to support the uptake of these standards-based profiles by care delivery networks. Regarding the IPS specifically, uh, IHE is also very actively a participant in the cross-SDO IPS working group that's convened under the auspices of GIC. And that's something that Susie called out, that this feedback loop is, uh, is important to us. And uh, to be honest, one of the things that uh, one of the things that's important all the time, but is especially important in the IPS work, in my view, is that these lessons that we're learning as IPS is taken up by various uh, by various groups, by various implementing jurisdiction, these lessons need to be uh, fed back. Specifications always look great on the paper, but it is when we when we deploy them in the wild that we get our turtle shell of scar tissue around what are the lessons learned when these when these are used. And one of the things that I've been especially pleased to see, uh, I, I'm a member of a team at WHO that's leveraging IPS as the foundation for digital COVID certificates, as an example. And these are being implemented with some urgency. And I've been so impressed, and I wanna call out and compliment uh, the teammates that we have on this, on this call and in, in within GIC regarding IPS 
I want to call out and compliment just how quickly we've been able to exercise this important feedback loop uh, in service of that use case as an example. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So uh, just uh, this probably should have been the only slide, but this is uh, to, to call out that um, IHE's Patient Care Coordination Committee was actually the technical committee that published the implementable conformance testable profiling of the IPS content model. Uh, one of the things that, uh, as, as Sylvia was talking about in the initial development of the IPS, it was for international care, for unplanned international care. But one of the things that we have found in the specification is how valuable it is as a as a toolbox to support continuity of care workflows. And that was explicitly called out in the, uh, in the IHE IPS profile. Uh, the next step in the uh, IHE technical committee is to profile the companion workflow steps that will answer the question, when and how do I construct an IPS? Is it something that is um, created and signed by a provider or is it something that can be dynamically generated in real time by um, a shared health record repository server? These are important workflow aspects that are that are to be done next as we learn from uh, the implementations in the field. I also want to make a call out to a, a passion project of mine. Uh, within IHE's Quality Research and Public Health Technical Committee, where I'm a former co-chair, we've had a long-running work item regarding uh, a computable care guidelines specification, and it requires as a predecessor that there is an international patient summary document that can be leveraged to drive what would, uh, what would be a machine processable description of a computable care guideline. Um, uh, again, this is work that is being done in collaboration with uh, WHO. They brand it as their SMART guidelines initiative. And in, for me, as I said, it's a passion project. This is a very, in my view, compelling use of the international patient summary uh, where I think significant value can be added to all of the care delivery networks that are taking it up. And I'm sorry if I ran a little longer than my, my three minutes, but that's it for me. Thank you. So I, I have a question for Derek and Susie. Um, in 2007, we created the Master Value Set Catalog for unplanned um, emergency cross-border use cases. And right now, you, Derek, told us that you have more use cases like continuity of care and CCG and so on. And are there any other domains or use cases that can be addressed with a SNOMED IPS ontology and uh, the new implementation guide from uh, IHE, like uh, oncology or um, COVID-19 use cases? I do have some, but Susie, I'll invite you to comment on that. First. Well, I was going to say it's actually a little bit different from uh, SNOMED International Perch because we create the terminology standard that is used by you. So others would actually drive the use case, and that way we can actually model the terminology because with SNOMED CT, it being a poly hierarchy and everything and not just a flat list of codes, we actually model in a way that uh, you know conforms to SNOMED CT um, specifications and we actually use conceptual modeling when we author. So what is actually useful is when we hear, you know, a particular use case, what are the needs, and then we can uh, create the clinical terminology to fulfill the user's needs and not just create, you know, new concepts and codes. So it's a little bit different from our approach in that we're not actually, you know, telling you what we can provide, you know, we see gaps here, However, we really need your use cases, and you being the global you, um, what you are doing and where you're seeing those gaps and where you're seeing more need. And then we can create the terminology that then all of my fellow SDOs and other um, organization partners here can then provide the, um, the value sets. And again, the profiles and the other guides that will then use those uh, terminology standards. So uh, to address your question in a little bit of an indirect way, but something that I think uh, everyone will find joy in hearing. Uh, I was providing advisory services to the Ministry of Health in Myanmar in uh, early 2020. And uh, one of the things that we 
took on as a way to try to mitigate our risk in developing a national digital health blueprint was to see which specifications we could, we could take up and not have to change. And one of the things that we did as part of an analysis was we looked at the IPS as a content model. We looked at what were the top 10 diseases uh, listed in the burden of diseases for Myanmar. And there's the Institute for Health uh, Metrics Research that, that publishes these sorts of things for countries. And we were able to leverage the IPS unmodified to um, support the care delivery, the guideline-based care delivery for each of the diseases in Myanmar's top 10. And uh, the reason I think that that's wonderful news is that it, it isn't exhaustive. And there, I'm sure, are use cases where it would need to be extended. But leveraging the value set, the value set, the, the uh, descriptions that are in the GPS and the value sets that could be created from that, we could, we could leverage all of those. Why I think that's wonderful is that, of course, for any country, uh, you also need to be able to create reportable indicators. And in fact, one of the other things that we found is if we were leveraging the IPS uh, in support of these care workflows, the audit records that would be laid down from leveraging the IPS in that way, laid down in a computable format, all of the data that we needed for the reportable indicators that the Ministry of Health would require to do their health system management. And that I thought was a very strong use case. One of the things in many low resource environments you see is that digital health is leveraged uh, in support of indicator reporting. And this was a way to say, no, no, use it for care. And you'll get on the back end all of the data that you need for indicator reporting. Yeah, we, we, we use the IPS in Germany um, for several use cases right now, for instance, for the vaccination certificate and um, or um, like the EHR, the new one that we will provide next year. Um, and it um, really makes things um, fast and precise. And this is what we need. We need precise. Um, um, semantics to uh, deliver uh, good patient care and um, have a better uh, patient um, uh, safety, have better patient safety here. Uh, so um, we don't have to convince any people anymore to do this in, um, in an international way. And these um, resources from FIRE, which are now chosen uh, by the experts, are really implementable. So IGE and uh, also HL7 do have um, connector thorns and um, we have here national connector thorns and even European, Europe, uh, Euro uh, um, connector thorns in Europe and it really works. So it's implementable. I think this is a real important issue. It's not just on paper, as you said, Derek. <laughs> But we have to, but we have to um, like learn how to use SNOMED because we weren't a SNOMED country before, and many countries are not a SNOMED country. So we have to learn how to work with SNOMED and to deal with it. But right now it's just a flat list, and that's quite nice. That's actually so. Yeah, right now we have uh, forty-one members and counting. Um, we are used in over seventy countries uh, globally, which is really exciting. But we do understand that for some, um, while you know it's very easy to come and talk to Summit International with uh, you know obtaining a license for their use case, we understand that um, not everyone's able to do that. So being able to provide these additional resources under Creative Commons so that it is freely usable by anyone anywhere, that's um, one really great, actually a couple of great products that we have um, developed. Um, with our new sub ontology, we're hoping to get away from just that flat list, like you just mentioned, Sylvia, and that's actually going to be able to allow people to leverage the um, relationships so that you can do some uh, aggregation, data aggregation. And again, we really see IPS as kind of the starting point, and then eventually where we can actually get to with health data is really exciting, definitely. I, I, my own personal experience is that the, uh, the creation of the GPS 
is a wonderful thin edge of the wedge for many of the low and middle income countries that I've been working in. And I know that they are able to license at no cost um, while they're while they're in that uh, World Bank categorization, socioeconomic categorization. Yeah. Um, and that I'm sure has driven uptake. I know some of the countries uh, in the Asia Pacific region that I've worked in have, have taken it up under that uh, license arrangement. But I think the GPS gave it even extra comfort and, and is um, driving the uptake of it uh, and generating value uh, quite quickly. It, it's uh, it, no cost and no cost are um, you, you would think six of one half a dozen of another, but Creative Commons and no cost for now for any country that's trying to grow their economy are not the same thing. And this has really driven, uh, I think, some important uptake and some important value creation. Yeah, and I, I do have to also give a call out because while the uh, Global Patient Set is a SNOMED international, I guess, product, um, of SNOMED CT terminology, it is still actually a product of all of our partnerships. So that is that encompasses all of our uh, presets that we create in collaboration with all of our collaboration partners like IAG, DICOM, the dentists, uh, the dentist experts from around the world. It's a number of presets that we kind of package all together. And it, it is exactly one of those things where it, it's not just us doing it on our own. It's in that power of collaboration with many from all around the world. And again, it's use case driven. And so being able to provide those sorts of um, resources and then now with IPS being such a, um, you know, it's starting to get adopted, it's being implemented in places. How can we um, provide SNOMED CT for kind of that next level, that next step? So GPS is one, one product. The next step is the SNOMED IPS sub-ontology and being able to provide um, better ways for people to capture and code and share data, but also that next step with the ability to do data analysis. So exciting, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and the um, syntax needs the semantic part. So we need this binding of, of uh, like the grammar, like our JSON, for instance, with um, like uh, the medical meaning and um, the um, concepts that you provide from SNOMED International. And then we need the testing uh, that um, IG is doing. And, um, but most of the part we need like people, like uh, this community, which is huge. Like I, I think there are hundred thousands of people who know something about um, IHE, HL7 and so on and work within this field and have a um, clear strategy toward, towards the, the JIC standards. And I think, and I, I just talked to my colleague um, at WHO, he's um, responsible for uh, the um, classification section, FIC, the Family of International Classifications. And he will provide to us in the ICD-11 in a fire format. And this is one step that we embrace as well. So because they are a part of us um, too, those uh, people. Is that Robert Jacob? Yes, sure, Robert, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, uh, as I said, I've been doing some work with the WHO team that's working on the digital health certificates. And one of the things that uh, uh, has been collaborative uh, in the work that we've been doing between the, uh, the WHO team, ICD-11 team, and, and the uh, SNOMED team that Susie's on. And uh, it's been, again, just, it takes a village. Uh, mm -hmm. In the face of a global pandemic, we, it's, it's very uh, focusing for us all to realize we're in this together. And it's wonderful to see the way, uh, sometimes rather urgently, that we can work together. Um, but the, the working together part was before this pandemic and will be after this pandemic, but the, uh, the uh, ability for us to collaborate quickly and effectively and well has been something I've had a, a front row seat to. So uh, I, I get a bit of a shout out to Susie, you and your team, and the, to see the way that they're engaging with the uh, WHO team has been wonderful. Yeah, no, we were very excited when, um, and Derek, I was excited to see your name on uh, the emails that were going back and forth and being able to participate and work closely with the WHO and the team on you know, those digital certificates and where SNOMED CT could provide those equivalencies for those data elements and everything. It was excellent. And like you said, it all happened so quickly and yet everyone was willing to jump in and provide the 
um, human power, you know, to do some of the grunt work so that we could get everything out the door. Because like you said, while we all have collaborated together in the past, I really think that with the uh, global pandemic and everything, we, all of our organizations really saw this as an opportunity to really step up that uh, collaborative uh, nature between all of us and provide those resources whether it be all of us working on a couple of those uh, new initiatives like digital uh, certificates or in other ways so that we could definitely uh, bring all of the needs for people in you know, COVID-19 and other uh, health data needs. Uh, since we are approaching a little bit the end of the slot, but maybe uh, I'd like to expand even a little bit in, in, or you could expand a little bit in your last statements on, on that, since you just mentioned the pandemic did accelerate the collaboration, if, especially also between the, the SDOs. Uh, what do you think uh, could be taken over? What could be an, improved to also um, be able to take this drive also in, in the future to accelerate this, this collaboration between the, the SDOs? Would you have some some wish would, what needs to be implemented to do this? I really I think that the JIC has provided a good platform for um, many of the SEOs to you know share what's currently going on uh, within our home organization with each other, and also you know we have a number of groups that have kind of little task forces that have developed um, for particular you know new products that we've all collaborated on. So I, I really think that having some sort of organization that provides that overarching uh, way for all of us to communicate and share has really been helpful um, through this pandemic. I mean, it was before, but again, it's that it, everyone really stepped up. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, it needs a, a global uh, coordination a global coordination office um, somehow um, and uh, some resources, um, the secretary to um, coordinate all the um, many, many um, efforts we have right now. Um, that would be my wish. I, I had an opportunity to see some of the recording from the earlier uh, JIC session today. And one of the things I noted was Graham Greve mentioned that the, the over, overloaded term connectathon was one that they wanted to use, even though they were very much focused. And, and Graham has said in his blog before, the HL7 Fire community thinks of implementers as software developers, and that every jurisdiction thinks of implementers as the people that are rolling out digital health solutions at scale in their care delivery networks. And one of the things that I think uh, is a very great first step that's just started happening in 2021 is that there's a, a conformance testing stack that has been made available at the uh, 2021 North American Connectathon for IHE. And that same stack was then brought to the following Fire Connectathon. And the same stack was then brought to the IHE European Connectathon. And the notion that this was about software developers, no, it doesn't add value yet until it's in the care delivery network, but that we can start to um, tighten that feedback loop from implementers and deployments in care delivery networks and feed that back into the SDO communities and accelerate the pace of that. It's somewhat driven by the pandemic, but I think that that's not going to go away. I think that that as a way of thinking um, for us is going to be something that endures and adds value for years to come. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much to all the, the panelists. We have approached the, the end of the, the slot for, for the panel. So thank, thanks again for, for being here and, and joining your, your insights. Um, we will now continue with a yeah, Mentimeter break. Um, uh, it's, it's a moderated uh, um, break and uh, this will be done by uh, Robert Stackwee. And uh, Robert is also an, a consultant based in, in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, he is also the current uh, chair of the European uh, uh, Committee of Standardization, uh, TC251 for Health Informatics. And of, in this role, he's also a member of, of the JLC. So Robert, over to you. Yes, thank you, Andreas. And uh, happy to uh, 
be on this break. It uh, gives uh, the speakers a break, but uh, it will engage the audience, uh, hopefully. And uh, as mentioned uh, before, your, uh, your input is highly appreciated. Uh, also through the Q&A, if uh, there's uh, things that you want to mention there, I saw already a post by uh, Christoph Gessner uh, there. Um, Please join us uh, on, uh, on the Mentimeter. The, uh, you can either scan the QR code uh, or just go to menti.com and uh, enter the code and you should be seeing the following screen. Uh, if I can get it there, uh, there we are. So this is um, the Menti uh, meter and uh, I'll just go into the, uh, the, the very first uh, question which is a, just a simple exercise question, just to understand uh, who's in our audience. So please provide us with uh, your uh, very vague uh, location um, so that uh, we can see who's, who's there. We have uh, in all uh, 75 uh, attendees. So I'm hoping for uh, quite a high number of responses. Uh, I'll, I'll take some, it'll take some time to uh, to actually get everyone started. Uh, the code is still up in the screen and uh, also so is the uh, the web address so you can uh, you can go there uh, easily and uh, we're seeing the numbers uh, growing already. So I was very uh, happy to see uh, and, and hear from uh, from the SDO panel about their experiences in uh, in working in, in different countries. Uh, we also uh, heard uh, on, with the announcement of uh, this uh, uh, panel or this uh, webinar that uh, Vietnam has also adopted uh, the IPS as a part of their core health data set. Um, so we're, uh, we're really making an impact uh, across the globe. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's definitely a, a thing to look forward to. Also the Q&A that um, I, uh, I saw in uh, uh, the post from uh, from Chris Gessner links you to uh, an overview of which uh, European countries are uh, are already live with the uh, the uh, patient summary uh, in the European cross border uh, services, um, and that's uh, uh, there's more waves to come. So and that that's listed there as well. So in the upcoming years, uh, we'll see the uh, the patient summary go live there uh, there as well. So we only have 33 yet. So there's still room for, uh, for people to, uh, to answer. Of course, uh, Daniel, very welcome uh, from Canada, Quebec. Uh, or maybe I should do this in French, but my French Canadian is, uh, is not so good or Canadian French, whatever it is. Um, so let's, uh, let's see what, if we can, uh, can go into the, uh, the, the actual uh, questions uh, now. You, uh, hopefully people can still uh, follow and, uh, and enter the, the Mentimeter if you haven't answered this question. Uh, I won't close the question, so you can, uh, you can still enter it, hopefully. Um, let's see if I can go to the next one and see. Uh, the next question is about which of the, um, standards and specifications that uh, that were discussed by uh, the SDO panel are you familiar with? Uh, do you know the IHE profiles? Uh, do you know the ISO standard or do you know the European uh, EN standard? The HL7 fire uh, CDAs, we, uh, we're seeing this uh, come up and uh, we've also provided uh, the colors to see uh, where uh, the most use or, or the, the most knowledge is about uh, the, the different standards. So this, uh, this should, be, uh, should be good. Of course, I lose track now because the counter says 54, but that's the number of answers. That's so not the number of uh, respondents. So I'm still hoping for uh, much higher numbers than we have right now. It's good to see that the IPS is, uh, is coming up uh, quite high on the list. That's... Uh, that's also a bit expected because that's uh, kind of the technology that's uh, that's being been easy to adopt. Uh, also, the CDA, of course, is the basis for the EPSOS uh, project and uh, for the current uh, exchange in uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, you might also wonder, well, what uh, what what about the ISO and EN? Your uh, your you may not be familiar with it, but implicitly you're using it uh, anyway. But that's up for the next uh, next question as well. 
uh, uh, I don't see too many differences in terms of, uh, of use uh, across the uh, continents, but uh, uh, there's, of course, the, the, the SNOMED IPS is, uh, is a bit, uh, bit low on the, on the European side, but uh, that's because some of the big, um, larger countries are not yet uh, as nomad members apparently um, and uh, as uh, Sylvia pointed out there's uh, the, the work on the master value ca set catalog uh, that's uh, that's been done and that's uh, not all snowmed uh, yet uh, it may it may uh, go in that direction at some point um, I'll go to the next question because this is just about knowledge but of course we're also in <clears throat> interested in implementation uh, and and uh, maybe you should uh, not interpret this as a as a personal question you could also interpret it as a uh, which of the ips standards is actually being implemented in your country uh, or in in your surroundings so there's uh, there's some answers here uh, uh, we did uh, we we do see the implementation gap uh, so nothing is uh, uh, implemented either by the persons responding, but uh, maybe not, also not in uh, in their country. IPS is uh, the fire IPS H uh, seven fire IPS is uh, coming on strongly, so the IHG IPS profile, and and here again uh, the, the fact that you're uh, if you have a conformant implementation of an IHG IPS profile. Uh, you unknowingly also implement both the ISO 27269 and the EN uh, 17269. So uh, we, we, we'll just add those numbers uh, somewhere uh, because it's, uh, it, they're interlinked as, uh, as the diagrams that, uh, that were shown by, uh, by Derek. Uh, they are interlinked. And if you're using the IH IPS profile, you're, you're using the base standards provided by ISO and uh, HL7 uh, as well. So that's, uh, um, let's go on to the next, uh, next question. Um, this is an open question uh, because we, we really want to, uh, to help you uh, bridge that gap between knowledge and implementation. So uh, our question here is uh, what type of support could the uh, standard development organizations provide uh, to, to ease the implementation of the IPS? So uh, please type a, a short answer I mean, uh, so that we can actually all see uh, this. Um, <clears throat> there uh, we're coming, good. Training, yes, of course. Information, uh, we'll get back to the information part uh, soon. Tooling, uh, I think uh, was already mentioned uh, by Derek uh, that uh, there is tooling coming available, both for testing, but also for, uh, for actual uh, implementation. Convergence, uh, we're hoping to, uh, to have shown you that uh, actually the convergence of, uh, of these standards is, uh, well, may, it might not be 100% perfect, but we're, we're really pushing on um, uh, the coordination of these uh, standards. So it's, it's not that, uh, uh, that they are being developed in, in isol isolation, uh, they are really uh, being developed in, in full coordination. So if you, uh, as I said before, if, if you implement the IHE profile right and you, you test uh, conformant to the IHE profile, you have also an, uh, a valid implementation of the ISO and, uh, and SEND standards. And if you're using uh, HL7 FIRE to do that, you're also uh, conformant with the uh, FIRE profiles. So education uh, was, uh, was mentioned there before. Uh, open standards uh, from a SEND perspective, that's also always a, a, a different or uh, a difficult question um, because uh, both ISO and SEND uh, tend to charge only a minimal uh, amount, but still charge for their uh, standards. And we're used in, in the health IT world to, to work with the free standards. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's not the case for SEN and ISO, and we cannot change that easily from our perspective. However, they are open because both SEN and ISO have the uh, idea of uh, uh, open participation and uh, making sure that everyone's at the table. So uh, 
that's uh, that's what uh, what we have a central web reference uh, we'll come back to that one uh, as well uh, free licenses uh, as i mentioned that's uh, uh, that's true of course uh, for the uh, for the snowmet uh, ips uh, and uh, and also for the hl7 fire uh, parts uh, it's uh, being free is a bit harder for uh, for sen and iso because they cover a very broad range and if just us want to have them for free that's uh, that's uh, a problem with the business model of uh, some of the national member bodies that uh, actually uh, thrive on uh, the sale of standards thanks for this input uh, we'll we'll take this along and uh, we'll go to the next question what what would you what kind of advice would you give us in in moving forward um uh, as, as mentioned by by Derek, we we are collaborating. Uh, there's also uh, there's uh, actually a biweekly meetings uh, from a coordination perspective to make sure that we're all moving in the in the same direction and uh, and that we uh, keep uh, aligned. Um, so, uh, well, thank you. We we will we will continue and strengthen our collaboration. Yes. <clears throat> Um, and we will share information frequently. Yes. Uh, ah, the extensions. That's uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, and hopefully, we'll hear some uh, some of uh, of the uh, about the, some of the extensions in the adoption and implementation uh, parts, because uh, of course there are uh, local uh, uh, requirements that need to be uh, be taken uh, taken care of degrees of digital readiness that's uh, well I, I i'm amazed at uh, at some of that discussion uh, given also uh, what uh, what eric mentioned uh, that uh, low and middle income countries uh, somehow seem to be more digital ready than some of the more developed countries uh, probably also uh, due to uh, uh, the legacy uh, implementations but uh, um i suppose i'll Keep this uh, open for just a little longer so to see what we're doing. The implementability of the IPS portfolio. Yeah, well, maybe that's that's uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, thing to to go into because we, uh, we, I don't think that if you're implementing uh, this, you you don't need to actually read all the uh, specifications that are out there. Uh, from uh, from front to back, uh, it, it can be a good thing to start with a, with an ISO standard. But if if you're just a, just uh, implementing a, a, a simple, uh, say for instance, a COVID certificate uh, or not not, not a COVID, yeah, a vaccination certificate based on the IPS, then you don't need to go back all the way to the uh, the ISO uh, standard to see what's uh, what's there. But, but you are in line and the ISO standard provides the, uh, the framework within which the different uh, implementation guides can be uh, developed. Uh, yes, the data set itself is only one aspect uh, and there's very many other aspects. We, we are uh, looking into that uh, from the coordination uh, group uh, as well. Uh, as uh, Derek already mentioned, uh, there's, uh, there's a quite some talk about uh, the workflow that needs to go around it but also the the, the provenance and the, and the ownership uh, and that might be different in in different countries um, there's also the uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of confidentiality uh, if uh, data is in the hands of the of the patient the the uh, same uh, medical confidentiality rules do no longer apply uh, so that's also something to uh, to discuss at some point in time. Convince policymakers. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's. Uh, I'm I'm not sure whether that's something that the SDOs can do, but we'll certainly engage with the likes of the uh, the GDHP to actually uh, make that happen, and uh, and move uh, move forward. So that was my part of this break or your part, your input to this, uh, this section. And uh, I'll hand back to Andreas. 
Yeah, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Robert, for guiding us uh, through these, these questions in, in the Mentimeter. And definitely uh, thanks a lot for the, the audience who did provide the, the input. As mentioned earlier, we will make use of that uh, input that you gave in, in an upcoming report from, from the GIC. And with that, uh, we move on in, uh, on the agenda. Uh, coming to the experience part, we had earlier about from the, from the SDO colleagues, uh, how they really work together uh, to uh, make this uh, possible even. Then uh, in the next uh, section, we come to uh, the first step to uh, a few of the adopters. In this case of uh, Martin uh, Diaz Maffini from, from Argentina. Uh, he is a fire expert in the Ministry of Health in, in Argentina and also Chief Medical Information Officer of, at the Hospital of uh, Aleman in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, so I'll take it away, Martin. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I will show you, uh, try to show you, International Patient Summary Adopter Experience from Argentina. You have to listen another accent of English, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and, uh, next, please. Uh, we, we, this case is a, a, a national, not an international, really international patient summary. <clears throat> we, we, we go going to expand this concept in the, in the next slides. Next, please. We're going to talk about uh, introduction and context, uh, what happens with interoperability in Argentina, uh, what we call IPSR, R for Argentina, and what, what are our next steps. Next, please. Okay, uh, Republic Argentina, this is the name of the country. We are in South America, in the south of the planet, uh, next to Chile and Uruguay, just for geographical reference. We are a federal country. That it means that we have 23 states. We call it uh, provinces and uh, autonomous city called Cava, Ciudad Autónoma de Buenos Aires, is the federal district of Argentina. Um, we have more than uh, 529 departments and, and local governments inside the provinces and uh, more than almost 30,000 health institutions nationwide. Um, we have uh, 139 federal health institutions, um, others that depends of the provinces, the provincial health institutions, so 6,500, and uh, a lot of private and social security funded health institution, and 4,370, uh, 4,000, sorry, 370 local governments health institutions. This is our map and, and, and our reality. Next, please. But, uh, we have just one national health ministry. This national health ministry have uh, uh, the national programs for medications, vaccines, and primary care for all the provinces. Uh, our, we have an NRC national release center for SNOMED City national national release center, and we um, try to, to to manage all the master files for healthcare agents. It's called REFEPS. Uh, in, in Spanish and healthcare facilities, REFES in Spanish. And we have 24 autonomous district provinces with 24 provincial health ministries and 24 digital health system, at least. Every, as, as we know, as we see, um, uh, we saw uh, every province uh, have more than one uh, health institution dependent of himself of the province or some department or private or what else. So this is a beautiful scenario for, an, for a national or you know, international in our case, um, patient summary, uh, the need for share this clinical information of the, of the patients, of the, uh, the, the people who live in, in these districts is very, uh, it's a very interesting scenario for us, or was a very interesting scenario for us and try to, to adopt IPS as the uh, tool to manage this reality. Next, please. 
Okay, uh, we start with the uh, interoperability bus. This is the, the name of the tool that we created in, in 2018. We start with this uh, with this tool and uh, the functionalities, the current functionalities and some, some of them are future functionalities are in a implementation uh, moment now. Uh, the, the, the functionality, the first one is to exchange digital, digital prescriptions, study results, and other critical documents like uh, IPS, uh, one of them. Next, please. Uh, other functionality of the interoperability bus was uh, the integration of information of uh, public health statistics, registries, and programs around the, the, the nation, right? Next, please. And uh, to, to bring interoperability support services like the uh, uh, queries of uh, master files uh, and this kind of, of interoperability support services. Next, please. And of course, share electronic health record uh, using IPS in, in this case. It's not the international patient summary uh, in the concept of, 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 of the base concept of the IPS uh, uh, as a trans frontier uh, uh, tool, but yes, it's a trans frontier tool, but inside this country, inside, inside Argentina, and the, the, the boundaries are the boundaries of the provinces. Next, please. Okay, uh, the interoperability bus have two kind of services. One uh, group of services, Firebase. Uh, next, please. These uh, services are uh, an AIG PIX patient identifier cross referring manager. We uh, try to use, try no, we are using uh, in production this, uh, this uh, AIG profile, uh, PIX uh, patient identifier cross referring man manager. Uh, trying to uh, share the, the location of each patient uh, inside the country. Uh, we have a immunization called Nomivac. Nomivac is the name of the, of the program. Uh, this is a, uh, a registry or of uh, immunizations around the country. Next, please. <clears throat> a master of practitioners. Next, please. And a master of of health establishments, the breakfast. This, Four uh, services are Firebase. Uh, next, please. Um, of course, IPS. We are uh, we are trying to we, we decide to adopt IPS uh, in 2019. We want to be uh, implemented in 2020, but we have a little problem for. COVID, you know, and this uh, move uh, the, the achievement a little in the time we are uh, trying to achieve it now. Next, please. And the non-standard services are uh, health coverage. It's a national health coverage service where you can um, query about uh, coverage of a patient uh, in the National Registry of Persons. This is the, the, the national uh, and, and centralized registry of person in Argentina. The SNOMED city terminology, <clears throat> we have a snowstorm uh, implementation uh, inside the, the NRC. And this is a, a service that we provide for every one of the dominions in the interoperability bus. The immunizations is, is, is a non-standard too because the uh, post of the immunizations in the NOMIVAC is non-standard, but the the, the get the query uh, is fire. Uh, we are moving to to try to do the post fire too. Um, COVID, uh, COVID nineteen suspected cases and tests. This is a, a national uh, program to try to 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 register all the suspected cases cases and tests for COVID nineteen. Next, please. Okay, in this interoperability bus, we have 47 domains, more than provinces, because some provinces are divided, are divided in his districts, these uh, departments, and <clears throat> uh, they have the, the, the decision to, to part in the domains in, inside these departments and not uh, as, a, as one domain for the province. We have uh, more than five uh, million uh, people registered in, in PICS, in the PICS part that I already uh, said. And uh, of these five millions and a half of people, 
47,500 um, are uh, sharing domain. That it means that they are registered in more than one domain. This is our target for IPS. This is a condition to, to share the, the, the information, right? Next, please. Okay, this is some of the, the traffic that we have uh, in the in the bus uh, interoperability bus. We have uh, 285 million hits in this period of six months, six months uh, in uh, less than six months, four months, and it's a very heavy uh, charge uh, uh, server that we are have to. To, to develop to, to, to do that. Next, please. And talking about IPS uh, and having an account, having account, having account uh, the IPS composition, we have to choose uh, in this first uh, scenario uh, which parts of this uh, recommended and optional. Uh, um, uh, parts we're going to use. And next, please. We choose to uh, use immunization because we, we, we have a, a very um, high uh, use of uh, the, the immunization. Uh, and, and, uh, and we have very controlled centrally uh, in Argentina. And, and we we decide to include it in our, this, our first uh, phase of IPS adoption and implementation. So we have medication summary, allergies and intolerance and program list that are required. And we introduced to recommended, uh, the as recommended the immunizations to our uh, first uh, phase of IPS uh, development and implementation. Next, please. So this is a, a sequence diagram uh, that I, Thing that you already uh, know, but uh, this is a uh, this is part in Spanish. I'm sorry, uh, the the bus uh, attempt to to a uh, dominion uh, and uh, with all the security uh, needs, of course, with the token. Uh, and the the principal endpoints are patient location query, where the dominion asks for. Asked to the bus, I'm sorry, for uh, different dominions where this patient was previously uh, detected. And then um, the next endpoint is a, a search of document reference where the dominions where the patient uh, was already um, detected uh, offer the different documents that uh, the, the patient have in this dominion. And finally, uh, get, get virtual binary where the, the specific document uh, is, uh, is obtained from the uh, dominion, the, the dominion where the patient was already present, uh, selected. So uh, one of these uh, documents is an IPS. And this is the architecture where uh, we base to uh, implement the, the IPS solution. Uh, next, please. So this is the provinces uh, that have uh, uh, provincial dominions, uh, and, and, and except the last one where, where it says Department of Buenos Aires, the Buenos Aires is the biggest province in Argentina and have a, a lot of uh, departments. So uh, there is no just one dom domain, uh, are a lot of uh, domains, uh, I think uh, 45 domains inside Buenos Aires that uh, uh, behave as uh, a, a provincial domain because they are very big. Uh, we we promote the fire adoption uh, for these different uh, provinces and, and departments uh, domains, and um, we uh, have uh, activities of uh, education and collaboration with these um, different uh, technical. Uh, responsibles of the, every province and, and department. Uh, we have a, a group of uh, uh, validation of system and, and interfaces, and this is a, a lot of work because uh, every domain have his own <coughs> uh, health system, health digital system, and we have to to validate that the uh, the procedures and uh, the software itself. Uh, 
um, conformance, the, 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 proce the, the procedures and the, the needs uh, that we <clears throat> ask for uh, be a part, be a domain of the interoperability bus. And then we, uh, at last, we, uh, we, we work with these dominions with a preparation uh, for production with security rules and audit of these uh, of these softwares. Next, please. Okay, this is a little timeline with a few milestones. Uh, what we, we, we what happens? We start uh, in August uh, 2019 with the kickoff of uh, the IPS project. Um, we start with uh, three provinces. Now the 24 provinces have some kind of of uh, of uh, develop uh, in this uh, in this project. Uh, we have two connectatons with fire connectatons with different provinces the first connected on was uh, for pro, uh, for um, seven provinces um four provinces because there are two two connected ones in, in this in this date um they connecting test environment and successful connecting test environment in october 2020 and uh, last october uh, 2021 we connect in a station environment seven provinces uh, in, in this in this connected on uh, and successful connect with these seven provinces and we have our go live with four provinces uh, of the seven that uh, approve the connected to, uh, to connecting production in this December 2021. I hope we can do it before December ends. I don't know. I hope. Just hope. Next, please. Okay, as part of this. Uh, um, this uh, education for the provinces and the technical teams of, of, the, of the provinces. We um, develop a implementation guide of uh, our uh, use case of IPS. This is Spanish, of course, uh, but this is the, the QR code for the, for the, um, the site where, where is uh, located the, the implementation guide or uh, down in the, in the corner, in the right corner, in the right, right corner, you have the, the link to, to enter there. This is a collaboration with uh, a lot of people, uh, technical people of HL7 Argentina. Uh, it's a, a filial of uh, HL7 International. Um, and uh, um, a lot of uh, architects and, and developers and, and politicals that uh, have a, a, a lot of meetings trying to to, to cons consent uh, about this uh, implementation guide. And of course, it's a dynamic implementation that really means that we, we change it frequently and is our uh, principal or, or, or yes, main tool to, to, to develop the IPS project uh, in the different provinces in Argentina. I think that I'm in time and I think that is the last one. Next, please. And that's all, gracias. Thank you, Danke, Merci, Shishu. Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Martin, uh, for sharing with us how Argentina makes use of the IPS to really Im improve the sharing of, of uh, health information uh, throughout Ar Argentina, even with the help of additional IG profiles, making a, a round package of, of that. And I, I wish you good luck for, for your go, go live in the next weeks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, with that, we, we come to the next moderated break, uh, moderated by Robert again. <laughs> yes, thank you, Andreas. Uh, very good to hear about the progress in, in Argentina. So now it's, uh, it's your turn uh, in, in the audience to tell us uh, where, where you are with the, uh, the adoption of, uh, of the IPS. So let's, let's just not start with the IPS, but just a summary. Is, is there a mandate in your country, state or region, whatever it's called in, in your part of the world? Is there a mandate for a summary health record to be provided? Um, so that should be a, a fairly simple question with a yes, no answer. Uh, of course, it might be a don't know uh, if you're just not aware of it, but I'm hoping for uh, quite some, uh, some input here so that we know that whether there's actually a patient summary well, legislation or other type of uh, regulation out there that uh, that says, well, 
we, we do need a patient summary to be exchanged uh, either in the support of continuity of care or for the purposes as in, in Europe for cross-border uh, emergency care. Um, so the answers are slowly coming in. Again, you can go to menti.com and the code is listed on the screen here that you can, uh, can list, uh, that you can enter. And Robert, we don't see your screen. Sorry about that. Why not? Uh, oops. And there we are. Hopefully. Is that better? Yes. Good. Thank you. So we're getting 16 answers out of 64. So please uh, keep on going either with your browser or your phone to uh, menti.com so we know uh, where we are. And, uh, and, and as was mentioned in the previous one, uh, where we need to lobby with, uh, with governments to actually uh, create a mandate for a summary health record. Um, still some people coming in, I think. Yes, there's some answers coming in still. Uh, we're getting there. Uh, in the beginning, it, uh, when I wasn't sharing my screen, sorry about that again, it was uh, a majority of no's, but uh, we're, we're getting a majority of yeses. So that's, uh, that's very encouraging. And there's 24 answers. Uh, I don't want to take too much time because I have a few other questions to ask and uh, we want to stay within uh, the time frame uh, allotted. So I'll uh, slowly go to the next question, which of course is on, uh, is it actually based on the IPS? And there's a whole range of answers. Uh, of course, if you don't have a, a mandate for a summary health record, it doesn't apply, uh, but uh, there's, uh, uh, could be either a full IPS compliant uh, standard or it could be something very local. And then at least we can see where there's room for uh, either support to migrate. Uh, this also links to uh, one of the questions in the Q&A and uh, please be reminded that you can still use the Q&A for any questions or comments that you want to make. There was a question uh, whether the current European specification for cross-border is actually uh, the same as the IPS. And uh, I did provide a, a short answer to that. And uh, there's, uh, there's more information probably to, to get from uh, Christoph Gessner, who uh, posted the initial link because he's quite active in the European eHealth uh, member state expert group. Um, it's a nice spread. Um, I was hoping, uh, well, of course, we cannot hope for uh, full uh, coverage of, of the IPS, uh, given that uh, the ISO IPS has only been uh, uh, published uh, uh, for, uh, I think, this, since this spring. Uh, of course, the HL7 Fire IPS implementation guide has been, uh, been around uh, a bit longer. And we did see earlier that uh, most people are uh, aware of the, the fire one uh, anyway. So let's see um, if, if this is the, the state of play in, in the countries uh, that you represent uh, from, the, from the audience, what, uh, <clears throat> what type of support would be needed to actually adopt the IPS as a national uh, original uh, implementation uh, standard. So what what would be what needed to be done would need to be done to to actually make that happen, and this uh, is also for the people who don't have a mandate for for a patient summary yet, um, but also for the people that have a, a different format from the uh, the IPS. And please, if uh, if you have experience in uh, in adopting uh, the, the the IPS in full, uh, please tell us uh, how that. Uh, that came about and, uh, and what type of uh, support uh, you got in actually making that happen. Um, government regulation, yes, that's uh, and promotion. More webinars like this, well, thank you. That's always helpful to hear. <clears throat> and yes, an implementation toolkit. Uh, and I think uh, we, we, we can learn uh, from, uh, from what has just been uh, presented uh, by Martin. 
uh, in uh, from Argentina, and and, uh, and and I know that a lot of that work is being uh, uh, brought to the global community as well. Uh, there is one tool that we use in the HL7 Fire Connectathon that's uh, originated from uh, from Argentina. It's an IPS viewer. Uh, you'll uh, be able to get access to that uh, as well, and it uh, it, it really takes uh, a JSON IPS and uh, and and visualizes it in uh, in, in sensible uh, plain text. So actually, that's that's first part of the tooling that's come from the international community that's uh, that's being made available worldwide now as well so that's uh, that's very good and, uh, and similar things are happening of course in the ihe world with the um, uh, the gazelle uh, uh, tooling for the uh, ihe connectathons and uh, the gazelle tools are also being employed now at the uh, at the hl7 uh, fire connectathons uh, uh, homologation, that's an interesting one. I, I, I'm hoping we're not going to try and do that uh, all across the world, but uh, maybe our uh, connections to the WHO will lead us in uh, at least partly in that direction. Um, but that's uh, that's a very good uh, thing. Yeah, a mandate to actually do this. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that we've been uh, striving for uh, in, uh, in a number of countries. Uh, change management uh, that's that's a, a really important one to to help people to actually move migrate from one uh, version to uh, to another and and we do need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that this is not a uh, a fixed uh, thing uh, and we will actually uh, move uh, uh, Move to next versions uh, anyway, but uh, especially in the in the early stages, it's it's very hard to convince people that uh, that they just changed or they just implemented one technology and that now they have to make changes already. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, you have to to um, be very careful in, in doing that, and that's also the discussion in in Europe, uh, as I mentioned in in my answer that. We're not going to change uh, from the current uh, CDA implementation to the HL7 Fire implementation overnight. That's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, we do uh, discuss how to move forward on, uh, on that uh, part. Um, so this kind of brings me to the end of this uh, break, but I want to have one last question uh, because uh, of course, uh, would you support a decision to actually adopt the IPS standard for your summary health record in your country, state, or region? That's, uh, uh, we know what the adoption process, and, and we just saw what, uh, what the adoption process can mean and what type of support is needed. Uh, so we, uh, we are well aware of uh, what can uh, happen and uh, what needs to be done. So I'm, uh, this is very promising and uh, encouraging again. Uh, only yeses so far. That's, uh, uh, it also means that there's a lot of work to do for, uh, for all of us to actually make this happen. And uh, this is not uh, just uh, putting the specs out there and, and just saying uh, uh, publish an ISO standard. I mean, there's, uh, there's a huge amount of work to be done to actually make sure that we get here. But uh, as was discussed in the, in the SDO panel, uh, there's this promise of, of data analytics. And I think uh, COVID uh, made us very aware of how important that is to be able to, uh, to actually provide analytics services in close to real time across the globe for certain, uh, certain aspects. That's not gonna, be true for everything all the time, but uh, having the infrastructure there is uh, is really helpful. So either people are skipping the questions, but uh, we get a resounding yes from the people who did take uh, the time to to answer. Thank you very much for your input uh, and especially for the suggestions on the support you need. We will take that under under consideration and uh, make sure we come up with a with a plan uh, and, and work out that plan with, uh, with all of you to, uh, to actually make this happen. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks again, Robert, for guiding us through these questions. And uh, thanks for the participants for, for providing their answers and insights. And uh, with this, uh, we um, move to our next speaker, actually moving from the southwest uh, of, of the globe uh, um, to the yeah, far north in, in, in the west to Canada with uh, Attila Farkas, uh, who is an HIT professional uh, with a long decade of experience. And he held uh, te uh, several technical leadership positions uh, throughout the industry. And he's currently with uh, Canada Health in Thurvey and is uh, shaping how Canada is addressing uh, the interoperability landscape uh, for the next century. Over to you, Attila. Thank you, Andreas. Um, hello, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. When the opportunity was uh, offered to us to come as one of the early implementer countries with the IPS to GIC to present an update, we definitely took the opportunity to do so. Um, it is really hard to present a complete overview of our program and the challenges that implementers face in 15 minutes, but I'll try to do my best to sort of highlight some of the challenges as I go along with my deck. And uh, where it's appropriate, uh, I will try to highlight the most relevant aspects of this. So next slide, please, Christian. Thank you for that. Um, so Canada Health InfoWay, some of you may have heard about us. Um, the focus of Canada Health InfoWay is literally on the pan-Canadian interoperability. And as you can see from this slide, uh, we all uh, are confronted with the same challenges. We need to have the ability to uh, have a common standardized format for data, and we have to have a focus on secure exchange of this in the healthcare settings. And ultimately, you would like to reach a point where patients have access to their digital data. Next slide, please. So uh, we've been at this for quite a while now. Uh, and along the journey, we kept measuring ourselves against uh, the international leaders in our ability to allow to, to offer uh, primary care physicians the ability to exchange information about their patient outside of the practice. So as you can see there from the graphs, um, we've been making some progress from 2012 since we started uh, measuring this. And even as late as 2019, we, um, we have been still quite, quite a little bit behind the leaders in the industry. So to no surprise, um, there, there is a marked focus in the country to try to close this gap. So we started work on this specifically because of the pandemic, um, highlighted the importance of sharing patient summaries in the continuity of, of care. And virtual care has become a significantly important initiative. So alongside this, uh, we started work focused specifically on sharing patient summaries in the January of this calendar year. So if you go to the next slide, Christian, uh, by the time the G7 meeting came along in, in June, uh, we were well underway in uh, discussions with our uh, uh, jurisdictional partners. Um, some of you may know that Canada has uh, 13 provinces and territories that have independent healthcare systems and have the right to self-govern them. And so uh, when the announcement came from G7 that uh, Canada is aligning with the, the adoption of IPS, we were very happy because we have chosen the IPS as the foundation of our work uh, in the collaboration with, with our jurisdictional partners. So going to the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that we started our program with a strong focus on trying to establish a proper governance structure. First of all, we did uh, months and months of um, engagement with the vendor community, with working groups, uh, with, with uh, stakeholders, uh, subject matter experts, and uh, discussed the opportunity with every single one of the provinces and territories in question. And quite a number of them that you see there in the circles have put their hands up as wanting to become uh, actual contributors to the development of a patient summary approach for Canada. We also have a couple of organizations that uh, are also C-level organization at the national level that try to do secondary use. For example, Kaiha is one of them. So uh, building on this collaboration, which you can see that it's um, based on the fact that we have data standards and architecture represented, clinical and policy contributions. We had a coordinating table that was responsible for doing the operational drive of the program forward. And then the executive table where we were keeping uh, the top leadership of these PT health teams aware 
of the progress and asking for recommendation and approval of, of direction. So going to the next uh, slide, uh, fairly early on in the process, it had become clear, and this is probably one of the first challenges that I would like to put on the table, um, being that um, we have multiple provinces and territories, in effect, implementation of patient summoning in Canada is a little bit similar to what you're trying to do here at international level. We're trying to do a standardized approach to patient summary exchange within the country, but um, with an eye towards um, opening up full alignment towards the IPS in the, in the medium to long term. So what you're seeing here is the start of the work is clearly local. There's a very significant change management that goes on with uh, trying to introduce new clinical processes in the, in the ecosystem, as I'm sure you're aware. And um, the feedback we were getting from provinces and territories was that, and more importantly, medical associations, was that if we are to invest so heavily in introducing new workflow for patient summary exchange, then we need to recognize that that has to support local transitions of care and other processes that are currently lacking. So the current focus of the project is literally to try to uh, solve for a local exchange of patient summaries and potentially cross within a province, cross province exchanges. And then the next step will be between provinces and finally international. So going to the next slide, uh, trying to recognize that the challenges that exist when you're trying to standardize the exchange of a patient summary are uh, of a different variety. And some of them are rooted in the fact that you have to have data standardization. So uh, we're all familiar with the base standards that uh, have been very nicely presented here in the beginning of this session today. Uh, but we found through the few decades of experience now in the space that they alone are not sufficient. What you need to do is you need to literally tie them together um, with the recognition that there's certain realities in ecosystems and a lot of services need to exist in order for a patient summary to naturally flow through these. Through these. And we're showing here on this slide a couple of, of elements of attention and concern that need to be addressed in order for this to work well. And we have digital identity, consent, authentication, the types of patient identification and security, the terminology services that need to be prevalent. So all in all to say that when we started developing the Pan-Canadian standard for patient summaries, we realized that this cannot be a level one standard, it has to be a level two standard. And so we're happy to report that that's what we ended up doing. Uh, patient summary is a level two standard. So if we go to the next slide, um, we just wanted to reflect on the fact that it is 100% based on the IH and NHL sample work that's been done in this space, which is again, uh, focused on the two standards that were just presented here, the ISO and the SEND standard. Um, we are trying to be as aligned as possible with the IPS standard out of the box. Um, and we're trying to make it so that it's a 100% implementable and testable specification. But we also recognized that in order for this to be successful, it needs to be broken down into its building blocks. And then these building blocks need to be assessed against those jurisdictional realities. So going to the next slide, I would like to talk a little bit about what did we do along the path of this project which as I said, started in January, we probably were ready to go in a more collaborative, cooperative fashion by early spring, late spring. And then we did a ton of uh, workshopping with jurisdictions, with the industry, with clinical experts, with the organizations that are relevant in the space. And the result of this um, have been a number of use cases that are uh, very much hitting home for clinicians to use. And we ended up with about six, seven use cases. And then looking at them, we realized there's no way we can do a fast lift with seven use cases that were all pretty intense. So there was a decision made at that uh, executive table to say, okay, let's break up our approach to patient summaries into two, um, into two scopes. So the first release, which is the one presented on the screen, 
tries to do literally entry into the market, which meant the healthcare provider should be able to create a patient summary, submit the patient summary to a central registry. Uh, another healthcare provider should be able to find that uh, patient summary and consume it, and so is true for the patient. So that was the scope of the project for release one. So going to the next slide then, uh, we ended up with creating a specification that recognized that the data model, the content data model has to be um, as aligned with uh, the Canadian reality as possible, drawing completely on the IPS. We started from the IPS model and then analyzed every single data element in those fire profiles against data dictionaries we could find in the field, be that jurisdictional, be that vendor space, be that uh, Kai high for secondary capture and EMR vendors. And we ended up uh, publishing a fire implementation guide with the profiles for this first phase and uh, an encompassing uh, patient summary specification that you see on the left side. So the blue uh, rectangles here show the core specification, which is implementable and testable. And then there's two supporting documents that we found are very, very important because they painted the picture in which this patient summary needs to exist and live. And one is focused on the reference architecture, identifying the types of actors and transactions that need to be true in the ecosystem. And then the second one um, ponders a little bit on the bigger uh, business um, reality and clinical state in which this needs to operate. It gives jurisdiction an ability to consider certain requirements when they're implementing because they need to support vendors in that, those implementations. So going to the next slide then, I'm gonna give you a very, very quick, uh, basically glimpse into what the first document looks like. Uh, Christian, next slide, please. There, so um, the link to the specification is available in the uh, PDF that will be distributed. You, you have the link there. What you see here is basically the natural breakdown of the type of actor transactions that we would expect as natural in the progression of creation, and distribution of the patient summary. Uh, we have based this on the MHD profile as our recommended avenue, uh, recognizing that while this is fire, it's still a document. So we, we would like to favor that. However, going to the next slide for a second, I would like to also reflect on another reality. Uh, certain jurisdictions have done extensive investments in API gateway type capabilities where uh, drawing on the 21st century experience of cloud capabilities with uh, robust API-enabled uh, security frameworks, uh, there's a prevalence in the industry that desires to have fire, straight fire transactions, the health information exchange type transactions. So we listed a number of options here for implementers to choose from. The first two are MHD with local and distributed. One is XDS, and then the third one was an HIE exchange that uses straight fire APIs. That part of the specification is still under development, but it has been recognized that it's required by certain jurisdictions to be able to participate. So then going to the next slide, I also want to take a couple of minutes to talk about um, what did we learn about the data model, the content data model. As you can see in this picture, we're trying to put together everything in one single slide. Um, Representing the IPS International on the left side, left column, um, the Canadian PSCA, the way it lines up with it, is nearly identical with some exceptions, notable exceptions. Uh, the red ones are gone, as you can see in the Pan Canadian spec. And the reason for that is realities in clinical flow and medical practice. In some jurisdictions, for example, allergies are not part of the primary care physician's responsibility to track them or the systems do not log them. Therefore, mandating a required capability is just not tenable. Pretty much all vendors would fail the uh, conformance assessment for that. What you see in the gray in the center is uh, for each jurisdiction, what is their immediate area of focus? You can see that nobody really posted all the IPS fields as required. Therefore, the release one that you see on the right side shows in blue and yellow and orange and green the focus for release one in terms of data model. So then these data models have been profiled. They also have had to represent another reality, which is important from an implementer's perspective, which is 
certain workflows in jurisdictions re require different coding systems. So the SNOMAD GPS code set is great and we left it in the profile as a de desired target, but it um, also need to be supplemented by other realities. So moving on to the next slide then, all I wanted to say um, is that we're in open cycle right now and uh, we're going to do a projected on, next slide. We're going to do a projected on uh, using IHG Gazelle that is going to try to um, test for these actors and using the data models that I presented. And with that one, next slide is a thank you slide and thank you very much for your time. Thank you a lot, uh, Attila, for, for sharing with us um, what it really takes to practically uh, implement uh, the international patient summary or patient summary overall in, in a country uh, on, on the example of, of Canada. And uh, with that, we already come to the, to the last section of uh, um, this instance of the, the open forum. And I'm delighted uh, to introduce uh, Steve Posnack. Uh, who is the Deputy National Coordinator for Health Information Technology at the ONC in the United States. And uh, yeah, he's also an instrumental role and we feel sure to tell uh, more about this now in, in the GDHP. Steven. All right, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, appreciate it. And um, as uh, the introduction uh, occurred there, I have a long title, but um, you can just call me Steve. So um, thanks very much for our audience today. Uh, hard to believe that there was, I think, up to, to 80 people um, that were, were very much interested in the International Patient Summary, which is great. Uh, special thank you to our colleagues at the JIC for leading this event. Um, always a pleasure to, to join you. Uh, as was mentioned, I serve as our Deputy National Coordinator for Health IT in the United States uh, and uh, help execute domestically uh, a lot of our digital health related activities. But on the global and international uh, scale, uh, I currently serve as the vice chair of the Global Digital Health Partnership uh, or GDHP, and uh, also serve as the chair for the interoperability work stream. Uh, and uh, that is as depicted on the slide here, uh, part of um, the, the many different work streams that we have. We have five in total right now. Uh, and we have a subgroup that is focused specifically on international patient summary uh, related work, uh, have executed on a number of different uh, activities, mini connectathons, uh, getting feedback, understanding information sharing, uh, how uh, different member countries are implementing uh, either domestically or in preparation for cross-border exchange, uh, other types of feedback into the standards development process as well. Uh, this is something for those of you that are familiar with it that started as a consolidated CDA. Uh, you know, V3 type um, standards process and has also evolved into uh, fire-based uh, specifications as well. Um, so, you know, with that, I just wanted to give a, a brief introduction to the GDHP. I know my colleague Herco uh, from the Netherlands earlier today uh, did the, uh, the pre-encore, I guess I'm doing the encore version of the presentation and moderation here uh, and, and gave a, 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 the brief update on, on the GDHP. Uh, we are, you know, relatively new organization um, consisting of uh, 36 members, and uh, it also includes uh, a few other uh, multinational organizations as well. Um, and so we have been, you know, working together in a government-to-government -government way to facilitate conversations across, uh, uh, you know, member nations and the digital health work that, that's uh, been going on. Um, the International Patient Summary is something that we have been invested in for quite a while uh, on the, the ONC and U.S. side with the early standards development, and, and this came out of partnerships with our, our colleagues in the EU um, in, you know, 2012, 2013, we had started to work on this, uh, and it's been great to see the continued engagement from the JIC, our various other standards development organization partners, uh, both in that umbrella and beyond. Uh, to help advance the work, and I, I loved uh, the present, the two presentations that we had today, which really shows getting this into real life implementation and 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 into real life production, which is ultimately what I think all of us are are working toward. So I don't know if we got Dr. Martin back. Um, otherwise, it'll just be me and uh, Attila from Canada. I guess not. So it'll be just it'll just be the two of us, uh, and we'll That's take awesome. the Q and A as well. That's right. Uh, more time for us. Um, so you know, one thing that that as our neighbor to the north gets to say, right? Um, 
you know, we have, um, you know, certainly the, the healthcare systems are a little bit different uh, between the U.S. and Canada, um, but you do have that same, um, you know, just like cross-border uh, for us in state, um, you know, going across, uh, you know, Canada and, and the different government jurisdictions. How have you found um, the overall IPS support in a, in a notional kind of policy way, or if there have been any distinctions? As we know, sometimes the technology is really the easy part. And it's more so getting, you know, agreement. I like the description that you have uh, about having the right, setting the right table. Uh, so a little bit more on that would be great. Absolutely, Steve. So thank you for that. Um, I, actually, you you alluded to this. I think it's very much worth emphasizing that this is not a technology project. This is first and foremost a change management project. And I think the one of the biggest values of IPS is that it puts together everything that you need to consider when you start talking about a patient summary, right? And so it was relatively easy to bring uh, jurisdictions to the table, the different uh, authorities to say, okay, we need to look at all these elements. And then the situation becomes a little bit more complicated because some say, well, yes, but what about this? But what about that? And then you go down in the weeds and you start looking at what is the data model applicable? But at the very least, you can get started from something that people have already agreed upon and you don't need to start from scratch. In fact, that was one of the decision points of the executive table. As I mentioned, we started before the um, G7 uh, in Europe. And uh, one of the things in the very early stages of the project was, should we start doing a patient summary from scratch or should we actually adopt IPS profiles as they are and then start from there? And we, we chose the latter. And I think it was the right choice. It's also aligning us much, much better to the IPS future. And then, as I mentioned, we literally just uh, gone into looking at everybody's data dictionary, having discussions with their medical associations to, to vet whether or not these are applicable and available. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, the, it's, it's been interesting. We've talked with um, you know, our colleagues from New Zealand are also adopting the IPS and they've chosen as well to use it domestically as a way to work the, from the bottom up. Um, the US experience has been a little bit different where we I think started more with what we thought uh, would be the best summary care and record and then have been working globally on um, you know, refining uh, what the IPS would look like uh, and that in between. It looks like we've regained Dr. Martin. Are you available? Hi, I'm, I have right. some problems of connectivity, sorry. We appreciate your perseverance. It looks like you've gone mobile. <laughs> um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about the, the choice, uh, just as we were learning from uh, the Canadian experience of, of using the, the IPS as a way to um, get, gain consensus uh, at, the, at the domestic level first, and then you know, as it may connect uh, internationally? Looks like we may have lost, at least lost connectivity again. Um, all right, back over to our, uh, our, our Canadian colleague here. Um, so what, what do you think, you know, there's, there's certainly next steps that you've laid out in your, in your presentation for 2022 and, and beyond for, um, you know, the, the Canadian health system. What could the global community do to help you advance the IPS? Uh, G7, which we've been a part of, right, has, has helped give that policy imprimatur um, is there any other work that we could do together as a global community through the JIC and the, the member SEOs to, to help advance this further? Oh, that's such a great question, Stephen. And I'm, I'm so glad you asked it. Um, I heard on a recent GDHP call that I was part of that if somebody doesn't ask questions about must support, that means they're not implementing. <laughs> because <laughs> quite frankly, this is where rubber hits the road. Um, when you try to actually represent a particular element as being important in a clinical transition of care or that the data is available to somebody that's putting it together, that's where you actually have to ask the tough questions. And you realize that the IPS in some ways is very, very firm and restrictive in what has to be in a patient summary. And it's perfectly acceptable when you're thinking about the fact that this was designed as a paper to join you on international travel. So you want to be as thorough and accurate and detailed as possible, but it's not always feasible to be used everywhere that way. And we have several examples where the must support 
uh, flags in the fire uh, implementation that of course are just a little bit too intense. So that's one aspect. Another aspect which the global community will have to probably consider in other countries as well is a reality where, for example, billing codes and a process in the clinical setting requires physicians to use certain coded terminologies that are not snowman. And so what are you going to do with that? Because you cannot change this overnight. So our choice was to slice the profiles in such a way that we show the GPS as the top choice but we also give the ability to implementers to, to choose a particular value set in, in a province. Uh, and we understand that this is going to be a gap and it is a gap that can be measured and then you can apply programs to it to close it. So those are some examples where we think that the international community has an opportunity to focus in on these things. Like how do we deal with this internationally? Um, I, I think these these are certainly one. Oh, and one more thing, which we actually noticed by uh, the review cycle that we put out, is it's very unlikely. And this goes back to to your um, implementation experience, Steve, in uh, in US. It's very unlikely that you're going to find the same architectural deployments everywhere. So some provinces will prefer an MHD type approach potentially. Others will have XDS and others may choose to have straight fire, health information exchanges. So how do we do this? We chose to put a reference architecture behind this so that we can show uh, what the topography of the problem looks like. And then even though implementers might choose different choices for implementation, at least it's very clear that you're only choosing from these three. And so you're not gonna have you know, a proliferation of interfaces everywhere. Great. Uh, we do have a Q&A that came in, so I, I think I'll read it real quickly. Uh, IPS has become a catalyst for collaboration across the world. In fact, a lightning rod, uh, the, the SEOs are collaborating actively uh, through the JSC and elsewhere, which is a great start. Um, number of initiatives like the GDHP, Global Consortium for eHealth uh, and for Healthcare uh, Interoperability and others, uh, heavily invested in pursuing IPS activities. Um, how do we link all these things up together? And I think, um, you know, I can start with the answer. Feel free to, to chime in. Um, you know, the, the GDHP has obviously been working at the, the government level to make sure that member nations are aware of the work. Uh, and, you know, for those of us that are uh, in the active development and deployment stage, um, you know, that certainly has a different tack than for some of the other member countries that are still looking at it. But we think the IPS can help them leapfrog, you know, the approach that they may take uh, and have a starting point, like has been discussed uh, both for Argentina and, and Canada today. Um, and it's interesting, you know, as, as I reflected earlier, uh, we the, the name is the International Patient Summary, but yet it's become a domestically implemented thing first as a as a stepping stone toward potential uh, cross border cross border and uh, international travel um, related use cases. So uh, we would love to see and, and get feedback, especially from the GDHP community to speak on behalf of those, that membership, um, other ways that we can link um, the, uh, the communities together. The Connectathons is one of those, um, you know, where certainly everyone can get around the same table and express the, the technical implementation challenges. Um, but like we just discussed, the, the reference implementation and architecture and the choices that are still out there, uh, we have that same mixture of IHE, blended IHE and FHIR, native FHIR in the US, among other um, uh, uh, more uh, unique uh, deployments. And so that will be, I think, a, a continued challenge uh, for all of us in the future. But uh, Attila, please, if you have other uh, points to make, please, please go ahead. Yes, uh, so I've been in the standard space for a good 10 years now, um, actively involved in them actually. and. I have seen the evolution of this collaboration and I'm very much encouraged by what's happening here today. Uh, I think uh, work that's done at GDHP, GIC, now it's coming into the focus and people are starting to take notice. So we definitely need to continue doing this. It's very hard to go to each individual uh, SDO and try to raise the same problem. And if they have representation at these, at these boards, it's certainly going to help everybody to a streamline and accelerate and find common threads. Awesome. So I think we are, uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Robert or, or Andres if, if, um, 
think we're just about on time if we, to yeah. keep you all on your agenda, which is always the moderator's responsibility. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank, thank you. You're perfectly on, on, on time and uh, the, the overall open forum is um, perfectly on, on time. So I think it's uh, more or less about uh, time to wrap up uh, a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, Martin had some some connection problems and, and we, we kind of lost him and he couldn't take part in, in this last discussion any anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, Stephen and Attila, I, I think you, you made up for that and did provide some, some great insights uh, from your side. So with, with this, uh, I'd like to, to thank again uh, all the speakers and I hope it was also interesting and uh, uh, for, for the audience. I found it very uh, exciting actually to, to see how the, the International Patient Summary, which was as Mont mentioned already, uh, intended for cross-border um, uh, care exchange now is really driving also uh, initiatives uh, inside uh, uh, individual countries, uh, which as we saw also um, to a certain degree also have borders between the, the health systems where uh, uh, international patient summary can act as a role model for helping them also uh, to improve the, the health communication inside uh, the country. But we also saw that there are quite some, some challenges and uh, only the, the IPS specification certainly is not enough uh, to uh, improve uh, the exchange of health information. There are many additional building blocks uh, which have to be implemented as we saw, for example, from, from the reference architecture uh, from Canada. And um, I noticed also that we had this also in the discussion and uh, there were some, some comments in the Mentimeter on, on that, uh, that it, it seems establishing some, some way or some, some facility to really uh, exchange, uh, uh, share experiences uh, between the, the countries uh, which are making progress in implementing uh, the international patient summary uh, seems to be a very, um, uh, would be a help, very helpful initiative uh, to drive things forwards and even also to support countries uh, which are still a little bit behind on on uh, implementing things and getting started and uh, uh, learning from from the countries which uh, are a little bit more uh, advanced and have made some some more progress on that. And I also noticed that there were some re remarks that uh, yeah more tooling, more education. Uh, would be helpful, and this is certainly something which the, the SDOs, which are presented in, in the Joint Initiative Council, can take up uh, to, to improve things there. Uh, notably, uh, of course, the, the FIRE community uh, is very advanced in, in that and providing lots lots of tooling, um, but um, there are also other ways uh, uh, for implementing uh, the international patient summary, like via CDA, and there's that, uh, many more things needed. Uh, to be able to implement it and more education and, and tooling on that uh, would definitely be helpful. And I also liked uh, the, the notion, this was also present in, in the uh, earlier session to, uh, today, uh, that um, addressing this as a kind of multi-step approach and not trying to solve everything at, at once, being uh, uh, actually from, from the industry side, we usually use the term also minimal viable product. So first define something which is pretty small but um, does uh, some something useful and then grow from there uh, that's exactly the, the right approach and certainly something to uh, to be learned also maybe to a certain degree also from the standardization organizations uh, which um, of course uh, always have to build the standards to cover many use cases um, um, but uh, as we saw also in the pandemic situation, sometimes it can, can help to just focus on a very small aspect and, that, and uh, address that and then move on to, to addressing the next uh, and additional aspects. Now with this, I come to, uh, to, to the, uh, almost to the end. Uh, uh, first, how, however, there's a new website uh, uh, coming, uh, uh, just, uh, put up uh, also with the help of the Joint Initiative Council on the International Patient Summary with lots of the information on, on that additional information uh, where there's also some implementation guidance, educational material, material and uh, communities of practice and uh, we uh, uh, definitely plan to, to build and extend on that. Uh, with this, um, I can come to the, to the end. Uh, just remind you again, if you want to stay updated, uh, 
look uh, on, on Twitter for the JIC Council, GI, GI, JI Council or the on LinkedIn uh, Joint Initiative Council, where we will uh, present uh, regular updates on, on progress uh, on the patient international patient summary, uh, but also on the other activities on the Joint Initiative Council. And with this, again, I thank you for, for your attention and uh, also thank again uh, the speakers and uh, I wish you a good rest of your day, wherever you are. <laughs>